is you're going to give yourself a nickname and you're going to you're going to come up and you're going to speak with your accent and you're going to drop the f bomb or you're going to you're going to rip on me and rip on you and you're going to rip on this guy and that guy and her and her her great work there oh it didn't but one day man you're going to get exposed because if you're not you the emperor has no clothes Hey, fitness fans, welcome back to the Future of Fitness podcast and interview series. This is your host, Eric Malzone, and this is episode number 101. He's back. Dan John, the legend himself, is back on the show. Uh, he was number three uh, as far as episodes go, and now he came back uh, for 101. And what a treat, man. I, I get so excited. I'm like a giddy schoolboy when I talk to Dan John because I have so many questions and I'm always learning as he talks. You never know where the conversations are going to go either. That's the best part. Uh, I had zero game plan for this episode, but it turned out great uh, because that's just who he is. You know, he always delivers no matter what. So if you don't know who Dan John is, shame on you, right? If you're in the fitness industry, uh, author of five plus books. In fact, he was working on his next book. Um, as we we're going through this interview, I could see him taking notes and scrambling down ideas for his book. I was like, oh, wow. What if I was part of that creative process? How cool would that be? Uh, so we'll find out in the, in the next book. But so where do you go with Dan John? I think, you know, I'm one of those people within the industry who's always eyes wide forward, right? Or eyes straight forward. Like, what's next? What's the next big thing? Is it tech, right? Is it some kind of user interface? Is it, um, you name it, what, what is next? But talking to Dan John, you, you're just not so subtly reminded that the fundamentals win the day, right? If you have solid fundamentals of how you coach, how you interact with people, how you treat people, you're gonna be you're gonna be great. And he always reminds us of that. And it's you know more than coaching, it's more than anything, just being a great human being, and how you should focus your learning process on exactly that, the process. Um, always be evolving. Always be looking at different points of view. Always reading and rereading as the topic of this uh, this podcast goes on. So it's a full hour and change. Uh, it's well worth it. Uh, anytime you get Dan, John on a podcast, it's going to be good. So uh, much love to Coach, uh, Coach Dan John for coming on. It's always great having him. Uh, before we get on to interview, just want to talk about the Fitness Accelerator again. So it's growing. You know, I just got off the phone before recording this with a member of our group and I asked her how she likes it. And she said, this is amazing. I, I've never seen anything like it. Um, but I see how my business is going to grow way faster than it would without the group. Uh, just the connection she's making, the general ethos of the group is giving more than you can get. And uh, everyone in there is living and we're very selective, like I said, with who we let in. Um, so if you're interested, you think that's a good fit for you in 2019. If you want to be part of a group that is doing nothing but good for the industry and in turn helping each other grow uh, much faster than we would on our own, then you should come check it out. It's fitnessprofessionalonline.com forward slash fit accelerator. And you can find the application there. And once you fill it out, uh, unless it's like Saturday afternoon where I'm seeing, I will get back to you within 24 hours and uh, probably have some follow-up questions with the application. Cause like I said, we are pretty strict on who we let in. So once again, it's fitnessprofessionalonline.com forward slash fit accelerator. You can get more information fill out the application and you'll be hearing from me very soon. So without further ado, episode number 101, Coach Dan John. All right, we got the man back, Dan John. Welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. It was, it was nice last time and let's see if we can do better. Yeah, and I, uh, you know, I have to personally thank you because when I got this whole podcast thing started, um, I had no idea what I was doing really. And you know, as, as anything, and uh, you agreed to, to come on my show. Um, you know, you're my third episode and, and now we're about, um, between my two podcasts, we're about 327 shows later. Uh, you know, I get you back and, uh, you know, hopefully I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more polished for you, but, that's, uh, that's you know, lot. you tend to make the show. So that's a lot. We well, that's impressive. Okay. It's a lot of questions, you know, yeah. questions. Yeah. Well, you probably have learned a lot. The problem with this format, maybe for you, is that it's going to, you know, you'll hear something, but you're not, since you're actively in a dialogue, you might not write things down as well. So mm -hmm. I could see a, a, a positive side of podcasting. And I can also see that you're trying so hard to make sure the audio's right, the visual's right, the, you know, 
you, you might just miss the fun of it. Yeah. But I'll do my best to make it fun. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's, I, I actually, I think, um, I don't, during a show, I don't fuss too much about that. I let my editors deal with it. Um, but what I do find is like right now I have everything closed on my desktop. My cell phone's off. I am about as engaged as I can be with a person besides being one-on-one, -on -one, uh, in the same room as, as I could possibly be. And it's, it's, it's actually a really treat because, uh, you have to be so fully engaged. You have to listen, you know, when you're talking to people and I find it to be great. Um, you know, cause everything's so distracted nowadays, right. With everything you do. I mean, well, it's how often am I sitting around in a group and you'll see this. <laughs> yeah yeah it's wild and you're out on a date with this beautiful woman and you're staring at your instagram feed and your friend yeah. tweeted that you know a monkey or something like that. yeah 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 <laughs> yeah so i i have a question for you to kind of get it started because i know you're uh you're probably just recovering from vacation mode you're out in ireland and uh mm -hmm. you know i'm i'm a i'm a um aspiring traveler quite a bit and, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, um, who I talk to are also what I call digital nomads and kind of travel around a lot. You know, what, what it is it about? Cause you said before the show, you spent about two months a year in Ireland. Just Ooh. Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. What is it about Ireland that you love? Oh, well, it's, it's Ireland. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, I go to Galway, I go to the West and you know, you, you would have a hard time finding kinder, more generous people than the West of Ireland. Yeah. I always tell people the least. You know, the least Irish town I know is Dublin. I um, mean, it's got a lot of historical stuff, but it's not very Irish. But what what you think of Ireland is the West, or in the South too, and even up Northwest too. I I, I work at uh, St. Mary's over there in, in Twickenham, London, and I always tell people, when you think of England, you think of Richmond and Twickenham. Uh, you don't think of what you'll find when you get there. And when most Americans actually think of York, York has a Mott and Bailey Castle. They've got this old, this old wall. As you walk down the streets, as you walk down the streets, the houses kind of come in like this, you know? Yeah. So, you know, uh, you turn a corner, there's this massive cathedral, and then you're back down the street. So, so we've been lucky because we have a lot of friends in Galway. So we go out there and it's, it's, I probably walk six miles a day. I swim in the Galway Bay every day. Awesome. Um, we make one or two meals a day, depending on, you know, uh, how things are going. Um, and then we probably, you know, we probably eat out once every two days, but it's often every day. Uh, so it's vacation-esque. Uh, I'm able to do all my work there, all my students' work and my college work, and I write there. And um, if you sleep in, you sleep in. If you, if you feel like freezing and it is the coldest water i've ever been <laughs> uh, if you feel like freezing i got a place for you uh we got a rugby games there uh we we're at a hurling game last time we got gaelic football we catch soccer uh yeah we just i give a couple of free workshops while i'm there i really like it awesome. um, a lot of friends got a lot of friends best best taco place in uh in uh in ireland is in galway uh, a weightlifting buddy of mine owns it, but enough of that. Let's let's move on to the uh, to the yeah. rest. Of the story. Yeah, yeah. So I um I got to interview somebody uh, within the strong first ranks, um, Artemis Scandalides. Sure. Um, if you, if you know Artemis, and she, uh, you know, I asked her on the show what books she she recommends. She basically recommended all of your all of your books. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, intervention was number one. We both agree that's something that that most trainers, uh, all trainers, really should should get into their lives. And, you know, we, the, the topic always comes up when you come up, because you come up quite often in podcasts, quite often. You and um, James Fitzgerald from, from OPEX and sure. a couple other people, or, or um, Tony Gentilcore and Eric Cressy, all these people. Um, but, you know, the one thing that I think most people respect about you the most is that you take all of this experience, right? And we talked about this last time. You boil it down to, like, just the simplest possible form that, that coaches can be like, okay, I can do that, right? I can do that, right? I can actually put that into play and, and start practicing it. So the word coach comes from the word coach. It's a vehicle that takes you from here to here. And the job of the coach is to make it easy. Now, uh, simple, <laughs> make it simple. But right. yeah, yeah. You know, I, I was talking recently and people thought I was joking. I said, you know, if you're working with an overweight, overfat client, bef before they start talking, 
walk outside, walk to their car, look in the back seat. And I said, I guarantee if any of you do that, all your mind will be blown open. And someone said, after why? I go, because you'll notice that they have 52 bags. Uh, the, the back seat's filthy. It's filled with fast food. It smells like, you know, that smell of old French fries. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, honestly, if you just cleaned up the back seat first, you'd be well on your way with this client. Because what happens is, and that's, okay, this is my, okay, it's very simple, right? The biggest <laughs> problem we have right now in 2018 is the, in political science, we used to call it noise. Um, you know, you used to always hear the thing, well, FDR knew that the Japanese were going to bomb Pearl Harbor. Why did he know that? Well, he had advisors telling him. He probably had advisors telling him that every day for five years. But mm -hmm. after a while, when you start to hear, you know, you, suddenly you don't hear it. Like, you have a drip in your faucet. When I come in your house, I'll walk over and try to fix it. You go, oh, yeah, it drips. <laughs> so for most people, the issues they have in 2018, I think, is that they've allowed their lives to be so cluttered. We were talking about, you know, going out to dinner with somebody and they're like this. Yeah, yeah. It's iPhone to their face. Yeah. iPhone to their face, uh, clicking on buttons. Uh, and, and again, I, I don't know if there's anything wrong with it, but there's no chance to declutter. And yeah. uh, and I I have always discovered that, you know, it's it's the little things that stops you from success. You know, it's not the fact that you didn't bench 400. You know, you only benched 390. That's not the thing holding you back as a discus thrower. The thing that holds you back as a discus thrower, she had to pull an all-nighter to write that term paper the other day because you put her off for four months. Mm -hmm. And that clutter, you know, you, you, you look at a house, you look at a refrigerator, you look at the pantry or the food cabinet, clutter, I mean, there's... Everything in there is car uh, cardboard carbohydrates, you know, bags of chips, boxes of Cheetos, nothing wrong with Cheetos. If, if you ever, by the way, there's two foods. If you ever see me eating, you probably don't want me to have the keys to the car. One's corn chips and the other one's Cheetos, man. Those are my crap. Okay? <laughs> just, just warning you straight up. And I only eat Cheetos at discus camp, but boy, once I start, man. So for most people, it's the clutter. And that's why I use that term shark habits so much to, to try to set yourself up. For example, I'm wearing the black shirt. I got 16 of these shirts. I'm always in the black shirt. There you go. Yeah. I have 16 polo shirts, the exact same. I have six pair of uh, barbell brand jeans, six pairs of Nike freeze. My thought is I don't have to use any brain space to, to, to dress. I have a little routine I do with the oral hygiene. I mean, it's not a big deal, but it's just what I do. I do it every morning. Uh, I have the floss sticks next to me. When I, I go to cryotherapy every day, uh, I freeze and I shake and I do a few other things. But when I drive there, I always floss because I have floss sticks. But I don't have to use any brain pan to do any of this stuff. Uh, I sleep. I don't want to use the brand, but this is an off brand. But this is a I sleep with these a, a full bottle of water next to me. I always try to reuse everything at least once or twice. In this case, probably about six months. There's a kind of a greenish, brownish top to it. I'd be a little careful if got too close. You can't let pregnant women near that thing. <laughs> but, you know, every night before I go to bed, I fill that thing with water. And so if I get thirsty at night, I just drink out of that. I don't have to get up, get a glass, because it happens to me a lot. Right. It, I think one of the things I could really... When people say I make things simple, it sort of bothers me in a way because what I try to do most is to is to declutter, to to, to not not wipe away but slap away the flies and the gnats and the mosquitoes of life, and so that you can you know you can see you can see clearly. Yeah. So you know when you talked about intervention, the one thing I I, I think I missed in there was focusing on the clutter and that's where the now the book now what stepped up and helped out and the two words are called shark habits and uh, the other one's pirate maps uh whatever your goal is you know write write the and if you want to be a great discus thrower here you go uh throw five days a week lift three days a week do a lot of olympic lifts uh do some power lifts but that's it okay so that would be so throw lift you know, sleep throw lift eat protein and veggies, 
uh, drink water. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's just, that's the road to success to be a discus thrower. So yeah. I was going to hand well, specifically. So is it, I said, said, just shut up. Hi, you know how to do the snatch and jerk? Well, no, but I was, I, I read a very interesting blog on it. No. Yeah. We'll learn the things and then, you know, get going. So yeah. I think the mistake I made with, uh, so that would be a pirate map, a very simple one, two, three, four, five daily thing you do every day. Mine is on the back of this computer, right? It's right there. And I can tell you because I know it by heart. And then shark habits is just everything else. Um, when a light bulb goes out, I always, if a light bulb goes out and I have to buy one, I always buy like eight. Now, if you're not living in a home my size, you probably can't put eight light bulbs. But the light bulbs are going to go out in the next 10 years. So the next time they go out, I don't have to go to the store. I've got one. You know, that to me is that to me is a shark out. So so here's my question for you, and this is by no means a softball. Maybe it is. Maybe it is a softball question. But um, you know, with all of, all of the conversations I've had in the last year with the fitness profession, I see, I see trends. Um, the world, I mean, I think we can all agree is complexity is is increasing daily. Right. I mean, technology is interfacing. It seems like we're inundated with more and more information. There's just a tsunami of content out there. People having issues getting heard. I see great coaches, amazing coaches, right, who are struggling to get clients at the time because there's so much clutter and there's so much false promise, right? Maybe social media. And I've seen great, I've had conversations with trainers who just gave up. They left, they left the industry overall, right? Um, What's your, like, if, you know, what's the golden you advice that you have for people nowadays, you know, young trainers getting started or even coaches who have been in the game for 10, 20 years, maybe, you know, are having those issues getting people coming through the doors. You know, what, what, what is that? It's buy low, sell high. I mean, yeah, everyone's looking for the, I mean, the magic formula. Yeah. And uh, the truth is, I mean, my wife and I did real well. Uh, We bought reasonable homes and we sold them. We bought them at a very low price and sold them when the market was high. I write that down. It's genius. I never, everything you do is genius. It starts with a good night's sleep. It starts, your day should begin with, you know, a moment, a pause, just to make sure you got everything going. Do you have a to-do list? Yeah. Um, you, I mean, do you have friends worthy of the name, you know? Um, it's, it, did you go for a walk? I mean, uh, did you eat protein and veggies at your meal? It, there's not there's nothing fancy or new and that's this is what we fight against you know these all these articles that have come out in the last few months about the obesity rate driving and the one came out the other day from huff post well there's nothing to do about it, it was like i don't want to read that article mm. I, I don't want to read that article so <sighs> you know there was a thing that happened in the 1980s and it was popular for some people, but it was unpopular for a lot. Um, and the Weavers, who were a musical group, they were doing one of their last performances before one of the guys. And he just kind of leaned over and said to the audience, this too shall pass. Hmm. And so we're at this strange time in the fitness industry where people cut you know, I have to throw in, yeah. You know, I wrote that one funny article one time, and I, I think it offended a couple of people. Where you, it was like a, a book generator, and it was like the, and then I gave you like twenty adjectives: alpha, hardcore, convict, prison, savage. You know, beastly, uh, <laughs> book of complex, simple, outrageous, nightmarish. You know, and it was like. Final word was like training. <laughs> yeah. The savage book of nightmarish training. Yeah. And the truth is, the stuff, I mean, I get it. I mean, if, you know, it, you know, there's always that 15 to 18 year old boy who'll buy into all this stuff. But the truth is, it's going to be pretty simple stuff that's the answer, you know. Uh, I don't want to say I'm frustrated because it, it, it happens all the time, you know. Um, yeah. There are so many books that I've said it better. Uh, the book, uh, yeah, was it Wolf who wrote uh, You Can't Go Home Again, the book about the blind guy and all that. Uh, we know that. You know, it's, um, you know, Sir Parsifal, the great story, you know, the, the King Arthur's Knight, who spends 10 years searching for what's been right next to him the whole time. 
And I, so I get a lot of wisdom out of those books. I get a lot of wisdom out of uh, legends and stories like that because, you know, a person's writing this book and in the case of Gilgamesh, 5,000 BC, Beowulf, earlier than 1,000, Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, 1,200 BC-ish, you know, maybe some of it earlier, some of it maybe later. And yet the same truths come true over and over and over. And so uh, as long as I can kind of keep my mind on that kind of thing, it seems to help me uh, a lot. You know, uh, you know, when you reread Ulysses as an adult, you know, some of the stuff just leaps off the table at you. You know, um, I, I always capitalize the word mentor and people will correct it. My editors, not Lurie, but the others. Um, and I'll write back because mentor is a proper name. It's the name of Telemachus's tutor. <laughs> so it should always be capitalized. It's like my first name and your first name. And here you have the story about this, this teacher who was so important that we, we, we still use his name today. And so here's a story from years and years ago, and I'm still pulling out information from it. So I would tell Okay, my my friend Jim says I always do this when I get a question. Okay, <laughs> I always tell people when you're confused, look backwards. When you're lost, look backwards. Um, two here's a quick example. This this is my current training journal. Okay, mm -hmm. nice. Then I pulled this a little black book. One, and I, yeah, I, <laughs> I I pulled this one out from. Uh, this one's from 2014. I was looking up. Somebody asked me about. Uh, somebody asked me about the what got us into this one workout, and I had to slide back to 2014 to remember why we morphed over into that because yeah. it's written in there. Yeah. Whenever I get confused, I go backwards. You know, I, I okay, here's okay. This is a friend of mine. Okay, this is a friend of mine. Uh, his name is Bob Humphreys. Okay. All American athlete from what, what 60. This is February, probably 62, 63, maybe. And it's got his workout programs from the 1960s, 62, 63. Right there is a perfect template for uh, coaching the discus throw. Let me see. If the, um, let's see what's going on here. I mean, and by the way, this is just me. This, I, I didn't set this up, but this is just the way I work. Yeah. If we get too, too deep into the rabbit hole, with discus throwers, I'll pull out Bob's workouts. I'll pull out LJ Sylvester's workouts from 59. Uh, I got Al Order's workouts in there. We'll say, okay, uh, well, and if that's not good enough, then I'll, you know, then I'll pull out the German training books on throwing. <laughs> We're from Bob's. And uh, we, can, we can see what they're doing, you know, 20. These are, those workouts are probably from the mid 80s. Yeah. So, and so all of a sudden you're, I say, well, he's doing this, this, and this. And I guarantee he handled it. So um, I don't see any lunges in what they're doing. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, aren't lunges a primary movement? Well, I don't see tele, telemarking. Telemarking. Yeah. Uh, on this game. They do it. Yeah. And wrestlers kind of sort of do it. But yeah. really, it's more of a, it's like you're getting tackled, really. Right. I'm not ripping on lunges. I'm just saying. It's an example. If you're gonna, if all of a sudden you're you're stuck as a coach because you have a vertical push, a horizontal push, a vertical pull, a horizontal pull, uh, a one-legged hinge, a two-legged hinge, you know this kind of squat, that kind of squat, a whole lunge family, you know a whole this. Uh, oh, we got anti-rotation. We got rotation. We got core. We, and all of a sudden, you look at the workouts. The workouts take six hours. Guys worked out for an hour back then, and the numbers were huge bench, huge squat, huge clean, huge snatch. What happens sometimes is to clarify things, I just go back. Hmm. I just go back. Now, I'm lucky. I mean, I have a um, – did I show you? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm down in my downstairs office right now. I have two. I have one I write in, and then I have – this is the one I kind of do more of uh, – then I don't want to show you everything because it's kind of a mess, but can you yeah. see that okay? Can you see that okay? Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Okay, so those are my journals. Like the, these journals of mine go back to 1971, okay? 
Wow. Uh, those are all the strength and health magazines. These are various uh, books that I'm, uh, these are the books I've kind of just finished. <laughs> these are great. These are from uh, the, this is a uh, flip books from 1936 on how to coach the discus. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Um, and of course, right here, you know, you see a lot of the dragon door books and, and anatomy trains and, you know, just a, a lot of the taller, thinner books are in here. You still feel okay? Yep. Okay, so let me just show you this great book. So this, I, I know, that's a flip book. It's a flip book. <laughs> and that's amazing. What's that called again? Uh, this particular one, so good. Okay, I know what I'm doing the rest of the day. I'm going to play yeah, this. Yeah, there's your evening right there. So if, when you go one direction, it's got exercises and uh, things like that. There's So the when the book flips pages, you can follow how Kenny Carpenter threw the discus and yeah. all the little exercises that he did to prepare. Yeah. So, <clears throat> okay. okay, there's your 1936 discus champion. And I would tell my athletes, guys, he threw 174. And then they'd be like, I'll be throwing that. I go, oh, but one other thing. He threw on grass in spikes and his weight workout was pull-ups and then and walking on his toes. Well, we also played football for USC in the fall. He was the Olympic champion. He also played football in the fall. The biggest tree on USC's campuses, the one he donated to the school, he got an oak, a small oak tree as part of being a gold medal winner. Wow. It's now the largest tree on the campus. My, my point, and I, I, know, I know I talked to my talk. I'm sorry. No, it's great. This is why you're a great interview, Dan. This is, this Here's my point. Tangents. You want to see my face? Yeah. Is when I get lost, I just go back to the roots. Yeah. You know, uh, in American football, we had that phrase, dance with the girl who brung you. Yeah. What got us here? Because this is what always happens. You know, you, you, win a, you win a state championship in football, and then you add all this stuff, and you go, oh, a nine next year. You go, what happened? And the kids will say, I haven't known who to block all season. You know, you went to that conference and had all this new stuff. You know, it, the joke is we used to use him blocking. Him blocking, yeah. I block him, you block him. And, <laughs> and I got to tell you, him blocking works really good. <laughs> so hey, there's no way you're going to keep up as a fitness trainer. Yeah. No way you're going to keep up as a coach. Because as, as soon as we finish this today, some knucklehead is going to come out with something new and different. Yeah. And it's, it's difficult. It's difficult. Yeah, if you don't mind me quoting Gilgamesh, you know, a 7,000 year old epic, you know, when he, he, he the, the alewife tells Gilgamesh, look at the child that is holding your hand. These things alone are the concern of men. Uh, on Sunday, we, my grandchildren came over and uh, we gave Josie um, a Batgirl outfit, you know. So she put it on and didn't take it off for 48 hours, okay? And my dog, Sirius, had just left to discuss a few months ago. He became Super Dog. And the two of them played for two or three hours doing their. My dog and my grandchild played Super. So I went into my old closet pulled out my batman outfit and ran around with them <laughs> no, you didn't <laughs> because these things alone are the concern of men yeah yeah that's interesting you know, I'm, I'm curious when if let's say uh someone sits down to you next next to you on a flight right and they they look over and they say hey what do you do what, what's your answer i always go okay it's a little hard to explain <laughs> and uh you know, like when people ask me, you know, I, I, one thing I say is I'm an author, but I really actually am. Right. I make a living as an author. I'm not that guy. Well, I'm a musician. You know, I sit in my house, in my mom's basement, and I, you know, uh, write song. I, I'm a poet. I, I actually do make money. So I'm an author, and then I'm a professor at St. Mary's in, a, in, a, in Strength and Conditioning. And then over at uh, Columbia College, I teach religious studies. And then I do workshops now on um, strength and conditioning. And then I donate all, I donate a lot of free time coaching, weightlifting, track and field, and anything else people need me to help with. Yeah. I do a lot I do a lot of volunteer work. 
uh, the other day I was working with a guy and he goes, well, how much should I pay? And I go, nothing. Well, he owns his own gym. It's like, yeah, trust me, downstream, it'll all, it'll all be better. Um, you know, I will, I will do fine because of this little time with you. So I start usually with author, then go to the professors and then go to mendicant strength coach, you know, wandering strength coach. Yeah. 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 And your, uh, your emails to wandering weights is, is one of my favorite things. I still, I have them all saved since like, uh, Ooh. since I subscribed, I think in 2013, I have them all in a folder. Uh, I haven't read them all. That would be a lie, but I have them all saved for a rainy day. You know, it wouldn't be a terrible, you know, so what I'm doing to get with the sword and stone section, do you go mm-hmm. down and read that part? I read your most recent. Yeah. So I, I think it's some of the best work of my career. Uh, yeah. It's really cool. Let me show you my first published article. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. Can you read that? Uh, a new look at Beowulf Poet. At the Beowulf Poet. Yeah, and, Beowulf Poet. And the, and the, uh. Com- uh, the, the Rocky Mountain Conference on British Studies uh, printed this up and gave it to me. This is my first printed article. My next one was on King Arthur. And then I wrote uh, another one on the history of Utah 4 H clubs because that's what I did my master's because they gave me a lot of money at the time. But I've always loved, you know, I love that kind of thing. I love uh, one of my old mentors, uh, Archbishop George Niederauer, used to always tell me rereading is the key yeah and i found that to be absolutely true in my life so yeah. the thing about the sword and the stone is that i put together all of them from the beginning i cut and pasted rewrote a few things and uh, i was telling larry the other day i go well the weird thing is it's 190 pages and so next time anyone says how do you write a book i would say well once a week come up with a page <laughs> yeah yeah, so that's not much. Well, it's more than you're doing now. So. Right, right, right. I can yeah. knock out. I can knock out a book in two or three months easily. Oh, it's crazy. Because, um, because for me, all, the work work is what. Well, actually, I'm I'm preparing right now for my new book. So there's always folders underneath the computer. Sorry about moving the computer, folks, so much. I know. Right. Underneath the computer is all this notes and stuff like that, and you'll notice that. Well, my journals that I need, uh, the questions that are coming up come from these journals. And then, so what happens when I write a book is I start to, you know, squirrel things, you know, you know, start to gather nuts. And and all of a sudden I notice, oh my God, that connects to that. So yeah, that's how I would go author first. Cause that's, you know, I, I, I have an honest conversation with my daughters every so often. If my wife and I die, they get 49% each of, uh, the, uh, of, the intellectual property mm-hmm. and then I have one of my godsons he has the other two percent the reason i did that and i was told to do this is that, that way um they can't they can't kind of screw each other over you know if one of them does the the prodigal son thing and just blows it you know the other one still has the majority you know has yeah. the majority yeah yeah, yeah, I don't think they will. They're pretty bright young ladies and pretty loyal, but uh, yeah, yeah. That was because I, you know, I don't. I honestly, I could honestly probably live the rest of my life on the royalty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's awesome. I mean, that's uh, you know, I talk to so many people, and I always keep saying, uh, you know, maybe I want to write a book. I'm gonna start writing, and then I have no idea what I'm gonna write about, and then, and then I'm like, well, maybe I'm just not there yet. You know, maybe like when I, when I feel a book, how old are you? Of me, I'm 41. Yeah. Well, I didn't, my first book was 2009. I was 52. Okay. I had written okay. those contrarian approach and those little free ones that are on the internet. Yeah. But a true book that you can, you know, squeeze and hold in your hands. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, um, I, I got to interview John Goodman from, uh, online trainers Academy. And, uh, now whenever I see someone wearing a black shirt, I'm like, Oh, Maybe they talk to Dan John because he, <laughs> yeah, you know, we both, we're both, we were talking because we both wear uh, merino wool, black t shirts. Yeah. Right? Great, great company. Yeah. You know, they, they just, uh, they don't, um, they don't smell really. So you can, you know, you can wear them, you know, over and over and they feel great. And it just takes that, you know, and I, I look at, you know, someone like yourself, right? Um, multi published author, um, well known within the industry. John is, is similar. Um, but he's in the online community, but at the basis of it, and I think this is a really important lesson is that we all try to eliminate 
too many decisions in our day, right? We just try to make some things automatic so that the creative work gets the, the majority of, of the energy and the time and the input. Well, I've been kind of blessed in a way being a, both a football coach and a track and field coach, American football. Yeah. Because, you know, when you're getting ready for a game, everybody looks and they, you know, they see the Stanford guys and they got 5,000 plays and stuff. But in truth, I used to try to have myself nine. We would go into a game with nine plays, you know, and I, if, if you, I'm trying to follow up with your point because I yeah, like yeah. it. Yeah. And when I would go in with 90 plays, we didn't know what we were doing. You know, my best teams only did certain plays in one direction. Now, you could say, well, why don't you do it the other way? And then I'd say, well, I don't want to say anything nice, but little Bobby over there, yeah, he couldn't hold back a kitten. So we got to run away from Bobby. <laughs> but, you, you, you know, you have a pass. You have a pass that looks like a run. You have a run, a run that looks like a pass. There's four plays. You have an inside. You have an outside. Quarterback sneak. I mean, you almost have it right there. And everyone goes, yeah, but what about, okay, have that magic special play. Good. Now you're up to eight. And what you got, okay, now what are you going to do? Because you're, you're just trying to move. And what really helped me is when I, I became a good football coach, when we just got fundamental and basic, repeated things, we had built-in rules. Here's a simple one for you. Every time we completed a pass, we would sprint up the line of scrimmage. And as soon as we could, yet now it, it was easier than now the referee has to get his fat butt out of the way. But as soon as we, we were ready to play, whistle went, we'd run a quarterback sneak. And you'd gain eight yards every time. Yeah. And people say, well, don't they know what's coming? Well, I hope by now we've done it like seven times in a row. But they don't because that defensive line, is, as nice as I can say about this fine, I mean, wallowing down the field. <laughs> He doesn't even get into a stance, and we're already eight yards past him. And so we had – those were rules for us. It was very much the uh, algorithms in my head. Yeah. So there's certain plays, you'd run a certain play, and everybody knew it was coming. At least my team knew it because it's what we do in this situation. It's who we are. And that helped me. So, I mean, we all know – okay, let's do the fitness thing. We all know you need to walk every day. We all know you need to work your butt. You probably should do some presses, doing some pulls, probably a good idea, right? Probably eat protein, vegetables at every meal, drink water. And wouldn't it be great if people got about eight to 10 hours sleep every night? Yeah. But that doesn't sell, coach. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the trouble. Right? That's why I have to write books that people don't buy. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I know. But, it's, but see, that's the problem with truth. Right. You know? That's the problem with truth, you know? You know, sometimes you'll sit down with somebody and they'll say, you know, how did you do it? And you'll say, well, and I'll have a cliche for it, like little and often over the long haul. I love that. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. I use it all the time. You know, look at you, it's like, but I want it tomorrow. Yeah. Well, well, good. Now, it is true. Some people have built-in advantages. I don't know if you, you read The New Yorker, but there's a... Uh, by the time this airs, I'm guessing though, but you know, there's this man of man of privilege who went to an elite this and an elite that, and he's been bolstered up throughout his whole life by a different system that I didn't have. Now, in full candor, the moment I was born, I was luckier than a lot of people. This is going to come off, so I'm going to probably get mad. Hi, I'm Dan. I'm a white male. I have had advantages because of those two things my entire career. I can stand up in front of a group of people and say, shut up. And because of my size and the way I do it, people will shut up and listen. Yeah. I get that. Now, if I was from a really wealthy family, there'd be a whole other set of edges, edges. And that's what you're always looking for is edges. You're just trying to get an edge on, on your opponent and everybody else. And if you start with a lot of edges, you know, there's a guy who's called the president of the United States and his dad gave him a million dollar loan <clears throat> and he keeps making these little comments like it wasn't that big of a deal. Well, my mom and dad, my dad, we're not sure graduated from high school or not. We're, it's because he joined the, joined the army. My mom, they had nothing because of the depression. 
you know, my brother Rich is the first person in our family history ever to graduate from college. And I know other families that Bob is the first person to ever graduate from high school. So there's these edges, there's these edges, there's these edges. Me, I build my whole philosophy as a coach on getting more edges. Hmm. 1976 Olympic high jump, the White Stone says, I guarantee I'll win unless it rains. Guess what happened? It rained. So he complained, he got the squeegee out, made a big show of it. But the funny thing is the guy who took first, his coach said, well, let's practice. And he would take buckets of water, he'd take a hose, and he would spray down the, 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 the apron, the, the run-up apron. And he got used to high jumping with slick surface. You don't always get, you don't always win because of the rain. If, if something comes, if you're one of my athletes, we're going to work on every scenario. I've told you, I think I might have told you this last time, but I think I've had my athletes win state championships because of bowel movements. And <laughs> in the state of Utah, you get the state track schedule <clears throat> just a few months ahead of time. Yeah. And then you look at it. And so I coached at a 3A school and I saw 3A shot put, 3A hurdles, 8 a.m. So I would start working with those kids to warm up at 8 a.m. Just warm up. Hmm. One of the funny things they'd say is like, oh, hey, hey, I got to go. At the state meet, you can't run off the field and go take care of business. Yeah. You have to stay there. So I would train my athletes with, well, basically sugar-free Metamucil. But uh, I would train my athletes to get up just a little bit earlier, take care of business, hmm. They were used to warming up a little bit at 8 a.m. They were used to throwing or hurdling at 8 a.m. Maybe not super, but the edge they had, I had a streak at the 8 a.m. flights that was just ridiculous. We would constantly have those out-of-nowhere performances because we trained. The, see the little edge? Yeah, yeah, totally. It makes total sense. Yeah. It wasn't much, was it? Right. It really wasn't. Now, yeah. you're taller and better and stronger than I am. But at 8 a.m., if I've been up for a few hours, I'm used to warming up at that time. I'm used to telling my body to snap at 8 a.m. versus, yeah. ooh, I have a chance to beat you. And yeah. on your first throw, you don't throw well, and I do. I just crush, crush you emotionally. Edges. Yeah. Edges. Yeah, that's so, that's so great. I mean, essentially, there's a word for that's used all the time now. I'm not – niches, niches. Right? I don't know which one you say. But it's it's – it's, I see the parallel there, you know, for, for a lot of, you know, trainers getting started and when I, especially when I have the opportunity to, to coach them into getting into business and get their thing, I'm like, I'm like, get my new, right. Find out where you can own it. Right. Just own it. Mark Fisher is. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's been on the show. I talked to him often. He's awesome. He was at my house Friday and Saturday night. Okay. All right. So we did a workshop together here in Utah. Yeah. Mark and I met. Oh, uh, in Clayton, Missouri, probably seven years ago. I just I just had surgery. And Tom Plummer had just warned me about never selling out because I'm the crazy uncle in the attic. And I sit down with Mark Fisher in a hallway, and it was a weird little hallway. And he started talking about this idea he had for a gym. And he told me that I was the very first person to go, yes, exactly. You can't be me, but I can't be you. Right. You, when I when I coach, I have a style of coaching that's not good. When I was a shitty coach, sorry, when I was a poor coach, I would try to be somebody else. When I finally figured out that this is me, my coaching, I got my athletes were better. So about a, not this Friday because Mark was here, but the Friday before, I went to a reunion. I bumped into a whole bunch of my old athletes, and they were telling stories about how you know. A, I started with one of my favorite stories. It's this team we had that we went undefeated, and uh, I won't go through all of it. We were we shouldn't have. And I'd walk. We take it. There'd be a timeout, usually them, and I'd walk out on the field. My athletes would do this to me. What does that mean? Push you away? Yeah, we got it. 
<laughs> go, go home, coach. <laughs> no, don't go home, but we got it. It was like, yeah. was it at all? It's like, we got this. We got this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If a problem and blocking would come up, I would say, I'd say to the offensive lineman, guys, they don't, they're not allowing, allowing me to play today. So you guys have to come up with an answer. Yeah. Uh, about game two, they're like, we got it. Right, we, right. Coach, it's it, we have to do him blocking, you know. It's a, yeah. I got him, you got him, you know. Yeah. And we just would roll on people because the, they they so two things. One, they were a unit. They were they were a, they were an entity. And then number two, they loved and trusted each other enough, and trusted me enough that we would always do the right thing. And if they did something, and they, and it, I don't think they ever made a call I didn't agree with on offense. <laughs> I, I can't think of anything. I did that. Oh, that's, yeah, that's pretty good. Better than I was going to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I, I like this conversation. And so when you're talking about niche or niche, depending on where you live, yeah, you know, but, okay, but let me add one more thing. Yeah. It has to be authentic. Yes. You can't invent it. And you'll know it's funny because I'm thinking of a couple of people here. Usually it's when you give yourself a nickname. That's always a big sign you're in trouble. You talk about yourself in the third person, that'd be number two. But, you know, all of a sudden you, um, I call it the emperor's no, uh, new clothes. Do you know the hand Christian Anderson story? No, I do not. Does anyone read anymore? Uh, Hans Christian Anderson has one, I'll, I'll sum it really fast. Um, it's a great little story. Uh, this uh, faker, this, this, uh, this, uh, you know, con man, so to speak, shows up at the king's court and he says, uh, I've just come back from China and I have bought the most expensive fabric in the world, but only people with exacting taste and a high level of, you know, sense of beauty and understanding can see it. So he reaches into a basket and, there's, and he reaches up like this. And just like you guys see there, there was nothing there. And the king goes, oh, my God, it's beautiful. I love it. And the whole court goes, yes, I love it. So he starts measuring the king, and he starts doing the whole thing. And, and the whole kingdom hears that the king, only people with absolute taste and you know vision can see it. So the king is walking down the street, and the little boy says, the emperor has no clothes. It is. And of course, suddenly everyone realizes that the king's, you know, cod piece is hanging out and he's walking naked down the street. But everybody <laughs> thought, you know, and I, I use that all the time in this industry because you're going to give yourself a nickname and you're going to, you're going to come up and you're going to speak with your accent and you're going to drop the F bomb or you're going to, you're going to rip on me and rip on you and they're going to rip on this guy and that guy and her and her, her great work there. Oh, it didn't. You're going to give yourself a nickname or call your people the whatevers. But one day, man, you're going to get exposed. Yeah. Because if you're not you, the emperor has no clothes. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. And authenticity is, is uh, it's a big topic now. You know, there's, there's a lot, like we talked about earlier, there's just a lot of noise. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of mimicry. Um, there's a lot of emulation. There's a lot of things where people see someone succeeding in an area, so they just do what they do and think that's going to be it. But people are people are smart. People know, right? They really do. And and uh, you know, I think it's you know, in my in my career, oftentimes I've, I've mimicked until I knew what I wanted, to, what to do. Right? There's certain points where you're just like, okay, I'll go, I'll go take a three day seminar with Dan John. You know, and I'm going to come back when I'm coaching. I'm just going to mimic what he taught me until I fully understand it and now i can apply it and now i can make it my own in my way right so i think there's a place for mimicry but authenticity rules out the phrase used to be fake it until you make it oh it's still phrase for sure and i tell young teachers that all the time you know you're gonna be nervous you know i first started teaching i was barely well when i first started to keep teaching college i was younger than many of my students but when i taught high school at first i was barely older than and, you know, you have to come in with this air of authority. Yes. Yeah. And that's okay. But you can fake it for about three days. But then it's, <laughs> and I'm okay. Actually, and I'm okay if you fake for three days. Yeah. You know, I'll, go to, I'll go to these different certs and things like this. And people will be trying to imitate this person and that person. And the people know. 
the people know it's not authentic. And and if I ever come off as in un or inauthentic, I don't know. in inauthentic, inauthentic, disauthentic. Okay. I, I think it would be very obvious. Yeah. Yeah. Inauthentic. But you know, I, because you know, I have the goofy what they call the old man jokes. I mean. I've done it my whole career. I've always had old man jokes. I love puns. I've loved puns since my youth. You know, I love poetry. I love epics. I you know, I don't know how many other people when they're lecturing toss Gilgamesh or Beowulf or, you know, You're the only person. one. <laughs> You're the only one. And if you try, and if you, and, and, but here's the funny thing you might find an epic or a story of, you know, some Hawaiian legend that just, resonates with you and all of a sudden you're a better coach mm -hmm. uh, you, you've been up in the northwest you know the northwest has got those wonderful traditions with the, the native americans up there um and one of my favorite is they were so they they had the opposite up there they had overabundance and so up in the northwest when it was uh, you know when one's one tribe was or one group was trying to honor the other they would give them so much stuff and then the other tribe would try to outdo it at the next celebration over yeah. abundance yeah okay so maybe that's something you can toss in i remember my uh, i had a professor one time explain to us that no in nomadic cultures on your birthday you get to give away things your birthday present is to give away things. And the big one, of course, was always the big 300 pound cast iron pot. So <laughs> your birthday came around, happy birthday to you, here you go. Oh, look at this, here's happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. And it's funny, cause you know, you, you hear stuff like that and it's kind of, you know, it's opposite thinking, right? Isn't that opposite thinking? Yeah, yeah. And you tell it to a bunch of 10 year olds, they don't necessarily understand it. Then you say, well, you have to carry everything you own on your back. Yeah. And what does that mean? Well, everything, mm -hmm. and, you know, you, all of a sudden you start to say, hmm, how can I make that lighter? You know, hmm, yeah. get rid of this or that or this. Yeah. Yeah. But it's an interesting I, thing too, because, you know, like I told you, I think before, maybe during this interview is, you know, my wife and I have been nomadic for yeah. thir 13 months. Right. And, uh, you know, when we first decided to move in and sell a house like you or, or rent the house, we had to get rid of almost everything. You know, and it's it's so difficult, yet one of the most rewarding things I've done because I boiled it down to one bag of clothes, yeah. right? My skis, my bike, my toys, essentially, right? And that's about it. That's it. My computer, you know, I have a camera and a microphone and uh, that's it. And it's, it's life uh, is a lot simpler, but it can get a lot more simple still. My wife and I had something not as drastic, but we went from a six bedroom, three bath house here, and then we moved to San Francisco. We had a two two, hmm. so we basically just gave away couch after couch after couch after bed after bed. We had an upstairs microwave, a downstairs microwave. Now, here's the funny thing now we're back here and we replenished all of it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a wild, it's a wild thing we do, right? It's a really, it's a really crazy the thing. Nice thing was the other night we had seven people in the house, seven adults, and they all slept comfortably. So yeah, you know, win for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I know, uh, you know, it's it's evening there, and I, I do have one, I have one question that I've been dying to ask you for a while, yeah. um, and it's it's simple, probably for you, but you know, in in today's climate, right? Today's world. Um, you know, politics are crazy, global climate, climate change, um, all these things that are happening, and, you know, the media is just, just way out there. Um, is there any books that you recommend that as a society or people listening should go back, read, reflect, and apply to what's going on today? Like some, I was reading an article about, the, I think it's a book in 1984, is that right? Oh, George Orwell's book. Yeah. 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 A lot of people are like, you know, more people should go back and read this book right now. Um, what do you, what do you reckon from him? I'm sure you've, you probably mentioned four or five books right now. Is there anything that you think for current just philosophy and, and wisdom and getting through today's 
you know, you're, you're asking me a tough question because I know we are the opposite of it. In many places that I look at, we are the absolute opposite of everything I believe in. Uh, it's been difficult for us. Um, the kind of family I grew up in, it, it's been, you know, I don't know if it'd work, but if you could read the Gospel of Luke, I don't want to go all Christian or anything on anybody, mm -hmm. but just follow my point here. Most yeah. people don't, so let's just try this for luck. <laughs> I'm with you, Coach. In the Gospel of Luke, there are 10 different dining experiences. Huh. They eat 10 different meals. And the more I understood the Gospel of Luke, the more I looked at it, the more I realized that that was by far the key to the whole book. It starts off in Acts 1, uh, verse 4. And the word is sin halesios, but it's always translated as sat with them. But it means ate salt with them. Uh, eating salt is, is, a, is a phrase that takes a while to unpack. But I think it was Aristotle said, they knew each other so well, they ate a bushel of salt together. Imagine eating, how many meals would you have to eat to have, eat 80 pounds of salt? Right. You know somebody pretty well. And that starts it off. It start, and, and so it's a meal here, it's a meal there. And, and here's the funny thing is they never tell you the menu at these meals. They only tell you who the people are. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's the people. It's the people. So if you don't mind, and maybe this will be boring for some of your audience, but it's well worth the time because Luke is trying to point out something very important. It's about the dining. It's we're dining together. Yeah. Um, that would be a start. Of course, can't help myself. I would have to always recommend, you know, the sword and the stone. This is the German right. version of it. Right. Right. It's right. Das Schwenkenstein Roman. Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's great. One small thing yeah. is the German word for talon is fang. Yeah. Fang. What a elegant word. Yes. Yeah. So when you get grabbed by a, an eagle, it gets fangs on you. It's little things like that. Boy, and, uh, there's so, uh, uh, give me just a moment because this is important. Yeah. You know, yeah. take one thing, and this isn't bad. Either if you went to uh, Aesop or Aesop's Fables, Hans Christian Andersen, uh, maybe find a children's book, uh, you know, the ones, uh, Little Red Riding Hood, the Grimm's, Grimm's Fairy Tales, mm. and go back and just not, don't go crazy. Uh, maybe the there's a book called Heroes, Monsters, and Myths of Greek Mythology, it's a Scholastic Book Club book, hmm. and they're all they're, they're children's book. A person, uh, Perry, Percy Jackson does a good job with these two. Hmm. Well, you read these books, and they're, they're, they're not children's books, they're, they are, but they're not. And you read them, and you start to realize that the same concerns have always been there for people. Hmm. You know, uh, the fox and the grapes. You know that story, right? Sour grapes. You know, you, you do know that story. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. I read a lot, dude. I read a book a week. I just, it's okay. all. So this fox, he's a beautiful bunch of grapes. Beautiful bunch of grapes. And he jumps up and he can't get him. He jumps up and he can't get him. He jumps up and he can't get him. He turns and walks in the way. He says, they were probably sour anyway. You ever heard sour grapes? Yeah. Yeah, where it's comes from. Um, uh, if there's there's, uh, there's some great stories of the Lakota, the Lakota Sioux, that are wonderful to read. Uh, you know what? Maybe here, here's. The, I was just thinking uh, now that I tied this over, you know, because I was going to say that Star Wars, Harry Potter, would be good, but there's a book by Joseph Campbell. Well, it's not a book, but it's an interview series with Joseph Campbell and Bill Moyers called "The Power of Myth," and you can watch the shows on Netflix and I think on YouTube, but it's about an eight, maybe 10 part, I think eight, where he walks us through the myths of time. And as you study the myths, uh, the, the traditions, you start to realize that the little Polynesian girl stories with the coconut and the eel and the Lakota Sioux story and the Algonquin story and the story of Sir Parsifal and the story of Gilgamesh, they all dance around the same things. Uh, to, to make it as crystal clear, clear as I can, okay, this, 
is a sword in the stone about a young boy who's orphaned. Harry Potter, orphaned. Superman, orphaned. Batman, orphaned. Moses, orphaned. Who's Jesus' father? Well, it depends on who you're talking to. Hmm. We can go through and probably come with a massive list. Carl Jung said the reason that was important because the orphan is we can adopt them completely hmm. as a community. I argued in, in one of my things when I was years ago that actually it's the question of fatherhood that is the engine. Theseus, Hercules, Persius is the question of fatherhood in the Greek myths. Here's a funny thing to counter it. Ulysses was such a good Ulysses, by the way, was the only Greek who did not want to go to the Trojan War. When they find him, he pretends he's mad and can't hear. And they famously put his son in the way of the plow. And he stops and saves his son's life. So, because Ulysses is a different kind of hero. Probably one of the most unique heroes in Western civilization. And if you follow that up and read James Joyce's Ulysses, if you can, I know it's tough, you get the same parallels, the same insights about fatherhood and things. So so let, let's to review, maybe go get yourself, in, and I would, and maybe even the children's section, get yourself a book on Greek myths, Viking myths, uh, Native American myths, Polynesian myths. Um, I was at the doctor's office. I have a thing coming up, and he, he he left me there. And I was in the little kid's room, and he came in, and I had three books open doing this because they all had they were all about uh, uh, the Vikings and uh, uh, the Celts. And I was like, I was just, <laughs> and he and he kind of got a giggle. He's a former student of mine. So if if that's possible, again, it would be looking back. It's looking back. And the thing is, if you don't know your own stories. If you don't know your if you don't know your own legends, you, you've just said goodbye to the past. You know, there's all those wonderful books back by Elliot Asimov, uh, Isaac Asimov. Elliot Asimov wrote Seven Days of Sunday. Isaac Asimov. It's the iRobot and stuff like that. Where he's not warning us about anything. He's just saying. Here's an interesting thing that's going to happen as we make robots and artificial intelligence. Hmm. And very quickly, we're going to be living in the real time in that world. Now, is it, I mean, are they going to take over and slaughter us all? I don't think so. They could. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> who knows? I mean, yeah, I a lot that have shocked me in my life. I think about it every day. Yeah. But, you know, if, if you don't have a handle on who you are, and, can I just add one more little book? Yeah, so here's what. So basically, I think uh, Luke, uh, uh, either the power of myth or just going in and reading it for yourself. Yeah. And the third book I really strong is Tom Cahill's book, "How the Irish Saved Civilization," and he, it's it's from a series called "The Hinges of History." Uh, I thought the the early books, "The Gift of Time," "Desire of, of the Everlasting Hills," were very good. I didn't like the the later ones as much. I, I I think he lost, but the Irish saved civilization. It gets you right there to a tipping point. And he talks about Augustine and Patrick and how these two were from different worlds and how narrow what we would call civilization. We, we hung on, we hung on the edge of civilization. Okay. And what saved it was a bunch of people who decided to rewrite all the books. What saves us always is dining, and rereading. Awesome. Awesome. I don't know if I can do any better than that. And no, I that's really that's hard for you to make dining and rereading. I don't know if I can do any better. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, so I, I know, uh, coach, you, you don't, you don't do a lot of promotion for yourself, but I, you're, you're working on a book. Give us, give us a little insights in, into what's coming down the pipe. Sure. Uh, we, I talked to, to Laurie Draper, my editor and pro publisher, and uh, people have been hitting me up on this for a while. And I've been kind of pushing it back, but uh, officially, this is my 40th year as a coach. Now, my neighbors told me that I actually were coaching earlier than that because yeah. I, I, I can't. When I think back, in fact, I gotta make uh, don't let me forget uh, intentional community in SSF. Uh, I just realized when I was young, I started an intentional community. And I didn't realize that until just this second. Wow. 
I have another story to tell them about. Awesome. So what I'm doing is kind of come up, I'm, I'm coming up with these big major themes that keep coming around. Yeah. One of the, the one I'm working on right now is I would read something in 1965, 1970, and hear it and grasp it, but not grasp it entirely. And then 10 years later, have a go back and see it again and go, oh, I can do that. Okay, I get it now. 20 years later, come back and go, oh, now I really get it. 30 years later, no, no, oh, I didn't get it, get it. Then. Now I get it, get it, get it. <laughs> And then now, 2018, I go, oh, my God, how I wish I could teach every six athlete because I would tell them this. Yeah. <laughs> Another one is, for example, uh, it works so well, I stopped doing it. And I'm probably going to just just chart out all these great things I did that work so well, I stopped. You know, I think that'll be that, that might not be a very good chapter, but it's funny. Oh, by the way, and Dan, uh, Dan Cleather just came out with a new book. Um, the Little Black Book of Training Wisdom, okay? Awesome. And Love the title. He quotes me on that. Oh, and by the way, the Ford was written by a genius, okay? <laughs> he, he quotes me. It works so well, I stopped doing it because yeah. I constantly tell the young, my young students, guys, you're not going to listen to what I'm telling you because somebody prettier and sexier is going to tell you something else. But 20 years from now, if you're still around, you're going to go, oh. I mean, look at your notebook and go, oh. One, here's a quick one, if you don't mind. Yeah. I call it pull my finger, okay? Pull my finger. Pull. You might have to explain pull my finger to somebody. Else, but, <laughs> but here's my finger, okay? So it's called point, point. So as a strength coach, my number one job is to build up this ability to deal with anti, anti this, anti that, anti this, anti that. You can call it planks, you can call it isometrics, you can call it anything you want. But then the next one is the one we all know. Uh, when I type, I push a button. We Everyone gets addicted to that. Mm. You know? And so I'm going to add more reps, more sets, and then more load. And most people stop their training there. And the third P is snap. But to be elite, you have to have all three. Point push and snap and a good strength coach blends those so effortlessly that it's very easy for the athlete client to follow yeah and you just did it again you just made something so simple yeah so yeah. some people get all focused on the plank yeah some people get all focused on three sets of eight and some people's nothing but boing 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 so every client you get does plyos well Edna has, you know, like, you know, me, I've got a lot of metal in me, yeah. but I can do plyos. We just have to spend a little bit more time, you know, wrapping me up with planks before yeah. I can do it. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I'm, so that's, that's one of the chapters. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's awesome. It. Do you have a title for the book yet? Um, yeah. Um, it's like 1979 to 2000, something, uh, 40 years with the whistle. Awesome. It. it might just be 40 years with the whistle. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, coach, thanks again. It's always oh, a pleasure. I learned something. I learned 10 things today in the last hour. So would, you mind sharing? would you mind giving me a little note or put them in the, <laughs> yeah. in the notes? That'd be nice. Yeah. 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 I will. That helps sure. me. I mean, that helps me. And, you know, not only as a writer, but as a, when I'm talking to young people sometimes, you know, Yeah. Uh, yeah. I read some other people's works sometimes. It's like, this is a one-off. This is unrepeatable. You know, you know, uh, and I, and I, many of the people I work with don't have those perfect facilities and those perfect athletes. So I, part of my task is to show them you don't need a two million dollar facility to make great discus throwers. Now you need a ball and a wall. You know, awesome ball and a wall. Hang on, pen, pen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Coach, I uh, I appreciate you coming on again. I know it's uh, I know you have a condensed feeding window in your life, so I know it's important that you got to get your dinner in before a certain hour. And uh, yeah, it's always a pleasure. It really is. So uh, uh, we're doing uh, tonight. We're doing uh, uh, a rice dish with and then uh, green beans and uh, uh, a good chicken. So it'll be a nice 
Um, I'm already up to, I think today, 13 vegetables. So I'll, nice. uh, I'll, I'll get over 15 different ones today. Awesome. Every day, folks, eat eight different vegetables. Yeah. Great. Not eight servings, just different. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, Coach Dan John. My pleasure. Thank you for doing this. We'll talk soon, okay? I'm going to go eat. Hey, fitness fans, don't leave yet. It's your host, Eric Malzone, and I have a quick favor to ask. Actually, three favors. So, number one, if you're a fan of our show, I ask you to do something that takes under three minutes. Go to iTunes, please, and subscribe to our show. Please, please, please. It means so much to us. It's so important. And then give us a favorable review. We would really, really appreciate it. And uh, I can't tell you how much it means and helps us out. So I know it takes two minutes of your day and uh, it means a lot to us. So please do that. Number two, go to our YouTube channel or Fitness Marketing Alliance and uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel there. Number three, if you like this episode or any of the episodes that we've released, share it on social. That's huge. That's a big deal for us. And when we put a lot of work into these episodes, uh, trying to give you great actionable content uh, for the fitness industry. So that would mean a lot. And that's it. So we have some big plans coming up for this show. I'll be talking about that in the next couple episodes. But thank you so much for listening. It means so much. And uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. I'd love to hear from everybody. Eric, E-R-I-C at fitnessmarketingalliance.com.